I think I see all my cues. Good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. All right. I'm going to say good morning to everyone and welcome to the Township of Georgian Bay Planning Council meeting for Wednesday, October 12th, 2022. It is now 9.01 and I'd like to call this meeting to order. And in the spirit of reconciliation, we wish to acknowledge the enduring relationship between Indigenous peoples and the territories they traditionally occupied. We recognize and deeply appreciate the historic connection they have to the place. The land, the water, the sky, and all that live on, in, and above it. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all the generations of Indigenous peoples who have taken care of this place and who continue to care for it. And we want to show our respect. Hundreds of years after the first treaties were signed, they remain relevant today. May they guide our decisions and our actions. We commit to learn, to educate, to honor sacred places, and to take action towards real truth and reconciliation. Megwitch. Council, any declarations of pecuniary, pecuniary interest or conflict of interest or anything along those lines? Seeing none. I have moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Douglas, be it resolved the Council adopts the planning agenda of October 12th, 2022, as circulated. Any comments, questions, additions? Councillor Cooper, please. Thank you, Mayor. And I mentioned yesterday, but reiterate today, uh, I would uh, like our clerk to give us an explanation with respect to um, a new business item for reconsideration. Um, I'd like to hear what the, uh, the rationale is. I've done a little research on reconsiderations and uh, it depends, I guess, on your local bylaws, but uh, I'd be interested to hear how, why we're hearing this. Thank you. Um, I do believe Ms. Way had, had an introduction prepared for that particular item. Um, so I, I, the, that was part of the plan is, is to is a, an expl a full explanation as to the whys, the hows, the ifs, um, because at that point we'll we'll have to decide whether we vote to reconsider. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any other comments on our agenda? All those in favor. And the agenda is carried. Thank you. We have one application on the under the Municipal Act public meetings. This morning, there is a public meeting scheduled for a shore road allowance, two shore road allowance closing applications. I will briefly summarize the procedure to be utilized for the meeting. First, the clerk will advise council as to when, how, and to whom notice of the public meeting was circulated for the proposed shore road, clause, shore road closings being considered. Next, staff will advise of the purpose and the effect of the bylaw and provide for any other information that is relevant to the applications, and staff will summarize any correspondence on file. From there, the public will have an opportunity to speak and provide comments to the bylaw being considered. Please be respectful of time and be concise with your comments. All commentators are requested to state their name and address. Council will then have an opportunity to provide comments for clarification. I now declare this meeting to be a public meeting pursuant to the Municipal Act of 2001 C25 as amended to deal with the following proposed shore road closing bylaws. R22-08 for 178 Stewart Lake Road, an R22-09 for 298 Stewart Lake Road for Zabrowski. To our clerk, <coughs> excuse me, to our clerk, please. Notice that the public meeting was published in a newspaper and notice was sent to the abutting neighbors in close proximity of the property at least 20 days prior to today's meeting. Well, thank you. And Ms. 
Levesque, I believe you'll be presenting this. So to our deputy clerk. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm just gonna share my screen here. I do have more screens than usual this morning. So I just wanna make sure everyone can see my screen. Yep. Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so the application this morning is for R22-08 and R22-09 for 178 Stewart Lake Road and 298 Stewart Lake Road. The Sherwood Allowance has been requested by the applicants to allow for future development. The Sherwood Allowance for Part 1 is 790 square meters at a cost of $8 per square meter for a purchase price of $6,320 plus HST. The Sherwood Allowance for Part 2 is 630 square meters at a cost of $8 per square meter for a purchase price of $5,040 plus HST. So the total price for Part 1 and Part 2 is $11,360 plus HST. The application was received on August 10th, 2022. The properties are located on Stewart Lake and are zoned Shoreline Residential Type 1. There are no open building permits on file and we've received no correspondence on this application. I just have a location map of the 178 Stewart Lake Road, as well as 298. And a little aerial view. I will note the properties are not side by side. So there are um, several properties in between. Um, the surveyor did draft um, the reference plan, including both properties, the land registry and HDR Graham had no issues with the survey. I'm just going to zoom in here. Oh. Sorry about that. Nice. Okay. Sorry, I'm just going to have to move this other screen to zoom in. Okay, and I've lost all screens. Okay, well, there, there's the reference plan. Um, if we need to zoom in, I can zoom in further um, later on. Um, Richard Zerbowski is present this morning if you have any questions for himself and I'll just stop sharing so I can see everyone. And I'll just bring Richard over now. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, and do, other than uh, the applicant, are there, do you know if there are any other members of the public who might wish to comment? And if so, if you could bring them over as well. There's no other members of the public present. Thank you. Mr. Zabrowski, do you have anything additional that you'd like to make? Any, any comments? Um, Sorry. Okay. No, I just on mute there. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'm not used we to... haven't heard a thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm not used to Zoom meetings. Unfortunately, I've been retired for a little while. Um, yeah. No, we're just simply looking to purchase the properties. Uh, so we have complete ownership right to the shoreline. Uh, we make use of the properties, so that, uh, it's really for peace of mind that, that we own the entire entire parcel to, uh, to the waterline. That's really all we're looking for. All right. Well, thank you very much. Council, any questions or any points you would like to clarify? Uh, Councillor Wienkel, followed by Councillor Jarvis, please. I just want to clarify, <clears throat> we're only talking about, well, one of the diagrams here has <clears throat> uh, two properties on it, but I assume this is just, just the one property, not two? No, no there's, <laughs> sorry, there's two separate applications for two separate properties. Oh, two separate properties. Part one is on one and part two is on the other. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so. <laughs> yes, that's yes. correct, Your Worship, the Councillor Wienko. Um, part one is um, 178 Stewart Lake Road, and then part two is 298 Stewart Lake Road. So it's two separate applications with one applicant who owns both properties. All right, thank you. 
Councilor Jarvis, you had a question? Yeah, I'm more to curiosity, uh, uh, Ms. Levesque, um, is it, I, I don't think we've ever seen a, a, a double application before for SRA. Um, I, I guess it's not unusual for this to occur? Through your worship to Councillor Jarvis, we've taken um, double applications before. They still have to pay their legal fees for each um, property for the registration, but it was um, just more cost effective for them to just get one reference plan done for both properties. I, yeah, I have no argument with that. I just, it's, I don't think, I don't recall seeing this type of thing before. Um, and then one other question, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, if it's okay. Um, 178 shows, and sometimes we have errors in the way the mapping goes. Is there is the building on uh, 178 partially on the SRA, but not on part two? Through your worship to Councillor Jarvis, actually both properties are located on the Shorewood Allowance. So I think part of the deck on 298 is located on the Shorewood okay. Allowance, and then the okay. full cottage for 178 is located on the Shorewood Allowance. Got it. Okay, just curious. Thank you very much. Council, any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, I have moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved that Council passed the closing bylaw 2022-085 to stop up, close, and convey part of the original shore road allowance in front of lot two, concession nine, being part one, plan 35R-26905, formerly the Township of Freeman, now in the Township of Georgian Bay, 178 Stewart Lake Road, for the purchase price of $6,320 plus HST, and part of the original Shore Road allowance in front of Lot 2, Concession 8, being Part 2 on Plan 35R-26905, formerly Township of Freeman, now in the Township of Georgian Bay, at 298 Stewart Lake Road, for the purchase price of $5,040 plus HST. and the council passed a deeming bylaw 2022-086 to deem part of plan M228 in the former township of Freeman, now in the township of Georgian Bay, 178 Stewart Lake Road, not to be a registered plan of subdivision for the purpose of the Planning Act, RSO 1990 CP 13 S 53. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. And with that, we end the Municipal Act public meeting portion of our meeting this morning. Thank you. And Mr. Mayor, yes. um, I see Brian Botex on here, but, <clears throat> and I don't know the situation with it, but he's not able to vote. Um, <clears throat> well, he didn't vote in the last one. So <clears throat> how are we going to handle that? Well, it, it, Brian. I don't know if, if maybe Brian can vote electronically or something. If, if Councillor Bochek can raise his hand, uh, I don't know if he can push a button to show his hand being raised. There, he's raised his hand. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um. All right. So now, the next portion of our meeting is the public. Planning Act, rather, public meeting. This morning, there is a public meeting scheduled for four proposed zoning bylaw amendments. I will briefly summarize the procedure to be utilized for the meeting. First, the clerk will advise council as to when, how, and to whom notice of the public meeting was circulated for the proposed amendments being considered. The clerk will also advise of the appeal procedures. Next, Staff will advise of the purpose and effect of the bylaws and provide any other information that is relevant to the applications, and the clerk will summarize any correspondence on file. From there, the public will have an opportunity to provide comments on the amendments being considered. Please be respectful of time and be concise with your comments. All commentators are requested to state their name and address and so, and sign in on the sheet provided. I'm, I'm sure the clerk will take care of that because I presume none of them are in the office. <clears throat> After the public discussion, the public meeting will be closed. Council will then have an opportunity to provide comments for clarification. I now declare this meeting to be a public meeting pursuant to section 34 of the Planning Act to deal with the following proposed amendments. Z2808, Wishart, 
Z2814, DeMarco, Z18-29, Thompson, and Z18-30, GBI Limited. To our clerk, please. Notice that the public meeting was sent by first class mail to the respective owners and assessed persons within 120 to 800 meters of the property subject to the proposed applications and to those persons and agencies likely to have an interest in the applications. These notices were sent at least 30 days prior to today's meeting. Included in each notice was an explanation of the purpose and effect of the proposed applications and a key map showing the location of the properties or description of the lands to be affected by the proposed amendments. Other relevant information may also have been provided. These circulations were all provided in accordance with the provisions of the Planning Act and the Township of Georgian Bay official plan. Members of the public are advised at this point that unless they make an oral or written submission to Council before Council makes a decision on these applications, that any subsequent appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal may, may, may be dismissed by the Tribunal. Anyone who wishes to be notified of Council's decision respecting the proposed zoning bylaw amendments must submit a written request to the Planning Department. All right, thank you very much. Which leads us to our first application, which is Z22-08 for Wisher 8 Island 3480. To our planner, Ms. Annie. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ms. Annie. I'm a planner with the Origins and Associates. Um, I will be speaking to the first application, and I will just share my screen here. I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, so the proposed yes. zoning bylaw amendment application is for 8 Island 3480, and the property and the owners of the property are George and John Wisher. The purpose of this application is to facilitate the development of a bunky, separate bed, and addition to an existing cottage by amending the existing zoning provisions to remove the building envelopes and removing environmental protection zoning from developable lands on the subject property. Here's the location of the subject property. The subject property is located on Galbraith Island, which is a subdivided island on the shoreline of Stephen Bay. The subject property has an area of about 2.24 hectares and a frontage of about 146 meters on its western shoreline. Here's an aerial view of the subject property. The property is currently occupied by a detached residential dwelling and a boathouse. All existing structures were built with the benefit of building permits and are legal structures. Here's a plan of survey showing the future proposed development on the subject property. Um, the owners intend to expand the existing dwelling, add a new separate bed, and a new bunkie on the subject property. Um, here's a schedule for the previous uh, amendment that was approved for the subject property in 2008, which was a condition of acceptance. This bylaw identified develop development envelopes on the subject property for the development of a bunkie, dwelling, septic, and boathouse. All the remaining lands on the subject property were zoned in market protection. Here is the amendment being proposed through this application, which is supported by an environmental impact assessment submitted by the owners, prepared by Beacon Environmental, and peer reviewed by Hutchinson Environmental. The lands identified in blue are the lands studied through the EIS, which are proposed as a development envelope through this application. The EIS concludes that these lands should not be considered an environmental protection area and development can occur on these lands with the recommendations provided in the report. Here are a few photos from the site visit conducted by staff on September 27. Uh, the first photo shows the approximate location of the sleeping cabin, and the second photo shows the existing dwelling and the abutting frog pond. Here are some more photos. Uh, photo three shows the approximation of the proposed addition. The deck you see in this photo will be demolished to facilitate the addition. And figure four shows the existing boathouse and dock. In terms of policy framework, the subject property is considered rural lands in context of the PPS. The property is designated waterfront area in the district official plan, is surrounded by cold water lake with moderate to high potential for archaeological resources. The property is designated waterfront in the Township Official Plan, located within the Go Home Bay Coastal Waterfront Community. The property is located adjacent to an unidentified fish habitat. The EIS submitted by the applicant classifies the abutting fish habitat as Type 2. 
Lastly, the property is zoned shoreline, res shoreline residential island type C exception well. Here is a summary of the planning analysis. The applicants for approval associated with the PPS as residential development and accessory uses are permitted on the subject property. The application conforms to the district and township process of plan as the environmental concerns are addressed through the environmental impact study. The recommendations of the study will be implemented through site plan control. The existing development does not comply with the provisions of SRI 312 zone as existing development is not located in envelopes which are identified through the previous bylaw amendment. However, it complies with all the other applicable provisions of the zoning bylaw except for the GFA of the existing dwelling. This GFA will be dealt with separately through a variance application. Staff recommend approval of the application on the basis that the condition, uh, I apologize for this, uh, because the application conforms to the is consistent with the PPS, conforms to the official plans, and maintains the general intent of the zoning bylaw. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, to our clerk, I'm wondering if we have any correspondence on file. So three letters of no objection were received from the Trillium Lakelands District School Board, the District of Muskoka, and the Madawaska Club of Go Home Bay. Two letters of support were received from Michael Owen and Ted Cape. Thank you. Do we know whether the applicant or any members of the public are, are present and if they wish to speak? Mr. Wishard and Peter Folds are here. I'm just trying to move them over. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Wishard, I wonder if there's any um, comments- There we are. Make. Uh, Mr. Mayor, my comments are very short. Uh, first of all, this has been a long journey to update the previous bylaw. Um, and I hope with council's support today, we can uh, have a bylaw that provides the guidance that both the township needs and I need in order to make any changes that we wish to make at our property in a responsible way. I should note for the council that this, act this rezoning action actually was initiated by the township because the previous bylaw was, we were unable to interpret it both at the township level and uh, as a property owner. And so this is to provide a better framework. It also though has been endorsed by, uh, because we were environmentally, an uh, environmentally protected site, but the actions that we are taking today, or I hope that the council will take today, uh, have been uh, uh, reviewed by environmental impact study by Beacon, and then obviously it has been peer reviewed by the township's uh, environmental organization, uh, Hutchison, and both have come to the same conclusion that this is a, uh, a responsible way of doing what we are hoping that we could do. So uh, I would like, with the support of council, hope that you will approve it. But I'd also at this point, if I could take one second longer to just thank the staff because uh, JL Richards and the township staff and our new CAO have been a wonderful counsel to me as we've been going through this process. As I said, it's a long journey, but I think we've now got something that we all can work with uh, and do it in a responsible way. So with uh, council's support, I hope we can move forward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you very much for your remarks. Um, Mr. Fools, do you have any additional comments or observations you'd like to make? Uh, Yes, very briefly, uh, as the clerk has indicated, we did file a letter indicating the Madawaska Club has no objection to this application. I think the, um, the Beacon Environmental Report more accurately depicts the portions of the property that are, that are properly zoned environmental protection and identifies an area of the property that is suitable for development. And uh, for that reason, we think that the uh, proposed zoning is appropriate and we have no objection. All right, thank you very much. Um, we're not aware of any other members of the public that wish to comment? No, no, your worship. Well, thank you. Then we'll turn it over to council. Any comments from council? Councilor Cooper, please. Uh, 
else, I'm going to be exceedingly brief, but um, I just wanted to say that I have been on site. I have uh, reviewed this very carefully um, and uh, want to say that I support this um, proposal and uh, I think it's a good solution. And finally, it's nice to see this uh, straightened out for the Wishards. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Jarvis, please. Yeah, you know, just for the comment, I think it's been over a year. Uh, we were out to the Wishard property uh, last year to have a look at this proposal and didn't see any issues at that time. And quite frankly, I think a lot of us felt that it was pretty uh, clear uh, how things would progress and they didn't go that way at all. They seemed to go in a, in a wild left uh, shank off, uh, off a sixth tee at uh, Oak Bay Golf Course. <laughs> uh, and I know what that's like, I've done it. Um, I, I too uh, am very appreciative of staff's work on this. It's been extensive, uh, Kristen Ram. So thank you very much. Uh, it seems to me that we were dealing with some planning back in uh, early 2000s that may have been a mit, mit, bit off site. Um, and uh, maybe we're going to be dealing with more of this type of thing down the road, which would be unfortunate. But um, nice to see it's been straightened out. I, I hope uh, Mr. Wishart can move ahead finally with these things. And um, it's a nice piece of property. Anyway, good job, uh, staff. Thank you. Any other additional comments? My interpretation of this is an improvement to our zoning bylaw from what was there before that obviously didn't fully capture um, the, the, the details of the property. I have in front of me a motion that moved by Councillor Hazelton Second by Councillor Jarvis, be it resolved that Council enacts bylaw 22-087 being a zoning bylaw amendment Z22-08 to facilitate the development of a bunky septic bed and additional an addition to an existing cottage to remove the building envelopes identified through bylaw 2008-49 by removing the EP1 zoning from the developable lands on the subject property. Any further comments or questions? All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I have one further question, if, it would, uh, if it's okay with you, it's to do with uh, now that it's been passed, uh, further, yes, uh, further paperwork that needs to be done. Go ahead, please. Um, I just want a clarification. Is it my understanding that there is now an uh, appeal period on this decision of about 20 days during which uh, the applicant cannot do anything on his property theoretically. Is that yes. correct? That's, that's my understanding. Can we provide any relief to that 20 days? Apparently not, because I've made that inquiry earlier. Okay. It's the province, not the township that sets that. Okay, just thought I'd bring it up. Thank you. No. Any other comments? Well, Mr. Wisher? Um, subject to, of course, the 20 day waiting period, uh, it looks like you'll have your new zoning. Thank you very much, Council. And thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And thank you to the staff again. I appreciate it. Thank you. Our, our next application is for Z22 14 or 2 Island 300, Georgian Bay, for the DeMarco family. And Ms. Sandy, is that yours as well? Yes. Uh, yes, Your Worship, that's please, me. Please, please share, go ahead then. I'll share my screen to start. Okay, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the proposed zoning bylaw amendment application is for two island 300. The applicants for this application are is, the applicant is Jean DiMarco and their agent is Stefan Ferback of Planning of Planscape Inc. The purpose of the proposed amendment is to facilitate the redevelopment of the subject property for new single detached dwelling by recognizing the by recognizing the new building configuration site-specific exception. The site-specific exception will also recognize the existing lot coverage of 7.4%, while 7% is permitted. The existing front yard setback of 9.6 meters for the dwelling and 8.8 .8 meters for the light and for the shed and lighthouse, while 20 meters is required, an accumulative area of 52.3 square meters for the freestanding decks, while 40 meters is permitted. 
staff recommend the council grant approval to the proposed application. Here's the location of the subject property. It is an unsubdivided island located in Jersey Bay. The property has an area of approximately 0.3 hectares and a frontage of about 103.8 meters. Here's an aerial view of the subject property. The property is currently occupied by a detached dwelling, a bunkie, a gazebo, a boathouse, a shed, and a lighthouse, a pump house, and three freestanding decks. Here's a plan of the existing and proposed development on the subject property. The applicant is proposing to demolish the existing dwelling, bunkie, and gazebo, along with their associated decks to facilitate the development of the subject property. Um, for a new dwelling, approximately in the same location as the existing dwelling. The property is currently zoned SRI 151. Special exception 51 permits only legally existing structures on the subject property. So any new development property, uh, sorry, I apologize. So any new development on the property requires a zoning bylaw amendment application. Here are a few photos from the site visit conducted by staff on September 23. The first photo shows the view of the island from water, and the second photo shows the existing dwelling on the subject property. Here are a few more photos. Photo three shows the existing boathouse, gazebo, sleeping cabin, and dwelling in that order, and figure four shows the existing lighthouse and shed on the subject property. In terms of the policy framework, subject property is considered rural lands in the context of the PPS. The property's designated waterfront area in the district of Chukran is surrounded by cold water lake with moderate to high potential for archaeological resources. The property is designated waterfront in the township of Chukran and is located adjacent to unidentified fish habitat. Lastly, the property is zoned for residential island type 1, exception 51 in the township zoning bylaw. Here's a summary of pl planning analysis for the proposal. Uh, the proposal is consistent with the PPS as residential development is permitted on rural lands. The proposal conforms to the district of Muskoka social plan as it re reduces the number of structures on the property and contributes towards maintaining a low density character in the area. The proposal results in the overall increase of front yard setback from the high water mark. The proposal conforms with the council official plan as a residential as residential development is permitted and front yard setback is not further reduced. Staff have confirmed with the township environmental consultants that an EIS is not required as more program works are proposed through this application. The development is also subject to site plan control pursuant to section F.3.3.5.1 of the official plan. A zoning bylaw amendment is required to facilitate the proposed development as exception 51 associated with the property zoning allows for only existing development on the subject property. It is staff's opinion that removal of the gazebo, which has a setback of about 4.6 meters from the high water mark, and removal of the sleeping cabin, which has a setback of about 11.3 meters from the high water mark, will declutter the existing shoreline piece. Replacement of the existing dwelling with a slightly larger dwelling in approximately the same location is not anticipated to have any major visual impact on the shoreline. The applicant is not proposing to further increase lot coverage. The proposed investment structure in the property will enhance shoreline, will enhance shoreline views, and the distance of the dwelling at its closest point from the shoreline will increase. The lighthouse and shed are existing structures, therefore, recognition of their existing setbacks has no additional impacts and is reasonable. Overall, the proposal represents an improvement in the existing development on the subject property from a planning perspective. Based on this discussion, staff recommend approval of the application on the basis that the proposal is consistent with the PPS, conforms to the official plans, and maintains the general intent of the zoning bylaw. That's the presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much for that. Um, to our clerk. Is there any correspondence on file in regard to this application? One letter of no objection was received from the Trillium Lake Lands District School Board, and one letter of no objection was received from the District of Muskoka, provided that appropriate development control techniques be used to implement on site phosphorus management and impact mitigation measures. All right, thank you very much. I'm wondering if there are any members, is the applicant or any members of the public who wish to? Um, comment on this application. I see both the applicant and landscapes with their hand up.
Ms. DeMarco, welcome. Is there any um, additional comments that you would like to make uh, with regards to this application? Your Worship, I believe her agent is available to speak. Okay. Well, I think I think we'll switch over then to Planscapes, Inc., according to your byline there. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council and staff uh, and the public. My name is Stefan Sherback with Planscape. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I have a very brief presentation um, today that I'd just like to go through. Um, again, I'm at Planscape, Inc., 104 Kimberly Avenue in Bracebridge, P1L1Z8. Um, obviously, I'm here today representing Jean DeMarco. She is here, but presently on mute, and she's available to answer or address counsel if there's any questions that I cannot answer. I've read the staff report in front of you and fully agree with the thorough planning analysis and summary of this proposal. Um, in addition, I just wanted to thank the planners at JL Richards for their time and efforts clarifying this request. We've had several discussions. Um, and we just wanted to, they also wanted to ensure that the proposal in front of you today clearly follows the overall direction of your plan, uh, together with the applicable zoning bylaw provisions. I don't want to repeat anything mentioned in the report, but I just wanted to highlight a few key considerations, uh, prior to you making an assessment and a decision, please. Um, number one, again, the property is an existing undersized and developed island. The current development contained on the island is, is historic and modest um, and based on its current location is considered legal and non-complying. Um, the applicants are, I'm gonna quote this, decluttering uh, the amount of development on the island by removing several structures and docks and rebuilding a slightly larger one-story footprint in the same general footprint. The overall lot coverage is essentially the same as what you see today, but obviously with fewer structures on the island. Um, the overall development um, is to maintain a modest uh, dwelling, uh, achieve a net benefit in accordance with the direction of the applicable planning policies, and more specifically related to the setbacks to the water, improving the situation in a number of areas. Um, again, there's a number, there's a reduction to the number of structures, and the uh, proposed dwelling will be low profile and uh, not overbuilt uh, in, 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 from, from my perspective. The proposed location again sees an improvement from the existing setbacks. Taking a look at the, the uh, footprint of the new dwelling compared to the existing one, it's essentially in, in the same footprint, slightly larger and uh, further away from the shoreline towards the center of the island. And more importantly, all other bylaw provisions will be met through this application. In addition to the planning justification report included in this request, I fully support staff's review of the applicable policies under the uh, provincial policy statement and both the official plans of the District of Muskoka and Georgian Bay. I fully support and agree their, with their recommendations and can confirm that the application, uh, again, fully conforms to the District of Muskoka and Georgian Bay official plans, and in my opinion, represents good planning. We would kindly request council support for this application, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thanks again for your time today. Thank you very, thank you very much. Um, I'm presuming we're not aware of any other members of the public who may wish to comment at this time. All right. That means, Council, your turn. But I would like to ask one question while Council decides what they're going to ask, and that is, I appreciated the uh, drone uh, shots of the island uh, in your report uh, from Planscapes, but I was curious as to the date of those drone shots, because water levels do, do vary significantly, and, and I didn't know when those shots were taken. Mr. Mayor, that's a very good question. Uh, the drone shots were provided to me by the family. Um, unfortunately, I, I I don't know the dates of that. I, I can I can answer that. I'm just oh. I'm just trying to figure out how to work this. A 70 year old techie dinosaur. Um, uh, my son in law from Australia was visiting for the first time three years ago. So those that's he 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 brought the drone and he took the drone shots. So in 2019, when water was relatively high, right? Okay, so so your island at its smallest, if I can put it that way, right? Okay, thank you. With that, I'll turn over to Councillors Wienko, followed by Councillor Cooper, please.
I was just curious as to the, the new structure. Um, the original structure was five meters, and now we're going to eight meters. Um, can you maybe explain why? Is, is this a two-story going in, or is it a peak roof, or, or why the additional three meters um, on height? Because obviously that will be a, a visible thing from uh, from the water. I, I think I can explain, uh, Mr. Rianco. Um, I, I had taken the square footage from the structures that I was destroying, um, the gazebo and the um, uh, middle cabin, I'll say, and, and I had understood that I was restricted uh, to existing square footage. So I simply added that square footage to the existing structure uh, to well to the the proposed new structure to replace the existing one that will be almost on the same footprint but shifted a little bit to improve the setback and I, I think that you know the net amount when adding the square footage from the structures that are being destroyed is more or less a couple of feet along one side of the building so there's no net added square footage at all. But the question was to do with height. You oh, went height? from a five meter height to an eight, eight meter. So is that a two story? Uh, like no. Eight meters, no. you can easily have two stories. No, it's not. It's not so a, why the eight meters? Is that a peak roof? Um, I didn't realize that it said eight meters on the application because it's a one story building that I'm proposing, and um, I don't know where the eight meter, I if, think, if it says eight meters, perhaps, um, Stefan, can you explain? Uh, why? Yeah, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to the councillor. Um, we're not seeking a variation to the height. It is going to be a one story. Um, I do not think the building itself is going to get to that uh, eight meter limit. That's just the maximum height within your zoning bylaw. Again, there's no variance to that uh, height requested. Oh, that's news to me. <laughs> All right, thank you. Hey, Councillor Cooper. Uh, two things, and and in, in terms of the height, um, I think the eight meters is what's allowed, uh, as I understand it, uh, as opposed to what's being may be being built. I'm not sure, but uh, mm -hmm. I, I think that's the confusion. So um, uh, uh, the planning allowance is one thing. What's being built may be another. Do we know what that is? But that's not my main question. I just wanted to know, do we know the height? It's going to be very similar to what is already there. But we don't know what that is. It's, it's less than eight meters. We know that, I think, but. It's well less than eight meters. And, and uh, I would think, what, what's the, sorry, did they say the existing was five? Yes. It, 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 so it'll it'll be very comparable, five to six. I, I guess would be the. Stefan, can you clarify? Um, yes, uh, through through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we've got some preliminary plans that show the height itself. It, it, it'll be um, a, a fairly low level uh, flat roof, and as it's proposed, it's going to be similar in height, five meters. Um, but the applicants have since changed their mind that they want a slight peak to it. So it will be below the, the maximum of um, eight meters. It's just at this point, there still needs to be a few building plans and, and support just to show how much of the peak is there. But um, it, I, the, the plans that are in front of me, the plans that were submitted with this application clearly show a one story. I don't know if you have the capability of um, sharing my screen or if, if council or the clerk uh, I could show it very briefly to give you a level of comfort that the choice is yours. I'm quite, to answer that, for me, I'm quite uncomfortable. I think we're, this is coming in under the requirement and uh, probably somewhere either close to or a little bit higher than before. So I'm, I'm fine with that. I did have a question and this is now going from having seen this quite some time ago, this application. And uh, so it's, I'm doing this from memory. I don't have two computers in front of me. Uh, to uh, determine this, but uh, I saw something on the uh, survey that uh, was a bit confusing for me. I wondered if we could bring up the survey because um, uh, I did have a question about that. Yeah. 
I hope everyone can see this area on my screen. Right. So my question is, I saw something here. I just want to make sure I understand. There was a calculation of area. Is that up in the upper left corner of this uh, drawing? Or there was a calculation around uh, high water mark versus... Uh, I believe you're, you're referring to the site plan. I'll open that up as well. But, but, yeah. The, the the yes that's the one thank you it wasn't the i i apologize it wasn't the survey it was the lot area calculation um and so it's just showing the lot area of 51000 52000 well really the lot area is 35000 which was used for this application which number because uh when in planning we use the high water mark for calculating total area. This is showing uh, some other number that uh, I'm not quite uh, sure why that is showing. Um, so speaking through you, your worship, uh, the area used for the calculations was 35,167.8 square foot or 3,267.2 square meters, because that is the total area above the high water mark, which is a 177.4 meter contour. I'm, I'm sorry, I have difficulty understanding. I couldn't hear that you've got an echo or something, or I have an echo. Um, but, and, and we did not, what I think you said was we do not, did not in any way use the lot area that is the upper set of numbers. I'm not even sure and curious why even that is there when it's irrelevant. And I do support this application. I'm just curious as to why that's showing. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I may, please uh, to address councillors' questions. Um, we, we were just stating the total area on the property. Um, in future, we will just remove it and just, just keep the, the contour area, the area above that contour. It was just there as a, as a comparison because it was shown on the survey plan, and we just took that survey plan and uh, moved it forward. So uh, again, in the future, I apologize for the confusion. We'll just make sure that we focus on your bylaw um, lot coverage. Thank you very much. I think it's important with with uh, water levels able to go to the 177.4 and in fact above, we, we must always keep that top of mind. Thank you. And, and, and I think it's important to note that in, in uh, Ms. Sandy's report, she made definite reference to 0 0.32 hectares. In other words, the uh, above the high water mark. Uh, Councillor Jarvis, please. Yeah, just a quick note of clarification. I see under building height in the actual uh, proposal, it says right there, existing and proposed height of the dwelling is approximately five meters. So I think that should clear up any questions anybody had. Uh, um, I think <clears throat> what Stefan was saying, though, Mr. Jarvis, is um, because of snow load requirements um, and drainage, we were thinking of changing the original plan for an almost flat roof to a a low slope peak just to get drainage and snow load uh, calculations down a bit. Yes, I, and obviously that's in the works of something we'll be going through with planning as well, correct? Right. Yeah, that's fine. Any other comments? I'm just gonna, <clears throat> I'm just gonna make uh, one additional comment repeating what I said before, how much I appreciated the drone shots, especially for an island, gives you a pretty good idea. Um, and maybe our, um, when we consider our budget in the future, we might want to consider uh, issuing a, um, the planning department to have a drone when, for their site visits, because I think that it might be very useful. But that's, that's aside from this report, just a little a quick aside. <laughs> I'll let my son-in-law know. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a um, Motion in front of me, moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Wienko. Be it resolved that Council enacts bylaw 2022-089 in a zoning bylaw amendment, Z22-14, to facilitate the redevelopment of the subject property for a new single detached dwelling by repealing the existing exception 51 and rezoning subject property from SRI1 dash 51 zone to SRI 1 dash XX zone, number to be filled in later. All those in favor? 
And that is carried. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Mayor, can I ask the gentleman from Planscape a quick question? Yes, you may. Um, so you uh, you note and you, in your drawing, uh, you have the lot area. And um, I'm wondering, is it registered on title, the lot area that is shown on your uh, your survey? Uh, I mean, sorry, not the lot area, but the, the lot boundary. So you've got, you've drawn lines uh, separate from the 177.4. And I'm assuming then that some surveyor when they registered this uh, property on uh, in the land registry office, had all those reference points and registered the property that way. Is that the case? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, to the councilor, surveyors have their own requirements to determine lot configurations. It's not necessarily from the planning perspective. We're simply taking that plan that they have provided through the real property report um, and then using it forward for the planning application. So unfortunately, I, I, I don't have that answer. That's a question that should be directed to a surveyor because they have professional obligations to legally describe or transcribe uh, property boundaries and limits. Okay, so the, the reason I was asking the question is it does look, if we look at your drawing, it looks to me like the registered property uh, actually owns land under the high water mark on Georgian Bay. And um, I just thought that was, uh, that was an interesting observation uh, given some of the other challenges we're facing on Georgian Bay. But it, it does look to me if that's, if, if the surveyor is registered that, that lot area um, and those points that uh, he's registered it and uh, Ms. DeMarco now uh, actually owns land under the water. And, and Mr. Mayor, I think I, through you, I believe that is the case. A lot of individuals actually have flooded land, uh, you know, simply uh, not necessarily in Georgian Bay, but on the other lakes throughout, let's say, Muskoka or inland lakes. There could be some um, damming that has occurred over time and where the property they owned actually is underwater in some cases, and they do own some flooded land. But again, that's why your zoning bylaws particularly state how you calculate lot coverage based on a high level, high water mark, um, and then adjust accordingly. So that's not taken into consideration or giving somebody the benefit of additional development for lands that they can't use. Thank you for that answer. Councillor Cooper. Thank you for that. And uh, I just wanted to uh, suggest uh, that um, from the Georgian Bay perspective and the planning department, it's my understanding the planning department can set the criteria that the surveyor use is in order to submit a survey. So the, I'm not objecting to this um, particular survey, but I think it's, it shouldn't have been uh, I shouldn't have been accepted in that fashion because really what we consider as lot area is above the high water mark period and the province owns the land under the high water mark. It's crown land. Thank you. Um, I, 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 two, two comments. One is our planning department did use the land above the 177.4 uh, high water mark in their calculations. I think that's important to note. And two, I don't think we're in a position to discuss who owns which pieces of land. I think that's part, that's, you have to go to Bracebridge and they'll determine because in some cases the ground does not own the land under the water. Or on, anyway, with that, we're getting a little off topic and uh, I think we should get back to our next uh, planning application, mm -hmm. which in this case is zoning bylaw amendment Z18-29 for two island 76 Thompson. And Oh. Ms. Bradford, are you the one presenting to us on this? I am. Well, then over to you, please. Beautiful. Allow me to share my screen. Everyone can see okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Okay, so good morning, Mayor and Council. 
I'll be taking you through application Z1829 Thompson for the lands located at 2 Island 76, or sorry, 760. This is a zoning bylaw amendment application to facilitate the redevelopment of the subject property by permitting an increase in dwelling height, an increase in width to an existing dock, and an expansion of an existing deck attached to the dwelling. Staff have determined that additional information is required in order to conduct a comprehensive zoning review and provide a recommendation to Council. So um, staff are recommending deferral of the application until a new plan of survey is provided by the applicant. The subject property is an island property located within Big Dog Channel on Georgian Bay. It has an area of approximately 0 0.16 hectares and a frontage of approximately 51.8 meters. There's currently one single detached dwelling with two attached decks, one gazebo, one boathouse with decking, two boathouse docks, and a U-shaped dock on the subject property. The property is zoned SRI 2-51. The exception provides that only legally existing buildings and structures are permitted on the property, and the maximum size of those existing structures shall be legally constructed. Here's 2018 aerial imagery of the subject property. Um, the property abuts the Robert Island wetland, which is an EPPSW towards the south and the west, and it's adjacent to fish habitat type 1 at the southeast. A site visit conducted by staff on September 23rd identified that the subject property is grassed with sparse vegetation and a beach along the northeast side of the subject property. So just a quick recap to bring you up to speed on the file itself. Um, in 2009, the applicant built two decks, a dock, and altered a boathouse to increase its height from 3.5 meters to 4 meters, all without the benefit of building permits. Um, so then a minor variance application was submitted and approved um, in December 2012 in order to legalize the structures that were built previously. Um, however, the boathouse height increase was not captured through that variance application. So then in 2018, a zoning bylaw amendment application, Z1829, was brought forward to legalize the boathouse height increase that was done previously, and then also to permit an additional height increase of 0.5 meters to the boathouse. Um, and then through this application, additionally, the applicant was also requesting to increase the dwelling height and expand an existing deck that's attached to the dwelling at the south. So concerns from neighboring property owners about the boathouse were received at the public meeting. And the recommendation at that time was that staff consider the public comments and prepare a recommendation report to be brought back to a subsequent meeting. Following that meeting, township staff worked with the applicant and the neighboring property owner to devise a plan that would be mutually agreed upon. And then a site plan was agreed to and signed by all parties, that being um, township staff, the applicant and the neighbor. Um, however, the applicant was advised that the remaining items on the zoning amendment application could not proceed until the legality surrounding that boathouse was addressed. So over the past four years, the applicant has been rebuilding the boathouse um, to bring it into compliance with the zoning bylaw. So with the boathouse now finished and built, the applicant is now wishing to proceed with the remaining items from the original application, that being the dwelling height increase and the deck expansion, as well as one additional request, um, that being the boathouse dock expansion. So upon further review of the application, staff have determined that additional information is required in order to conduct a comprehensive zoning review and be able to provide a recommendation to council. Um, staff have requested that the applicant provide a plan of survey in order to calculate the lot coverage and the setbacks and determine whether any additional zoning relief would be required through the application. So at this time, staff are recommending that council defer the application until a new plan of survey is provided, at which time we will bring back um, uh, the, the report and the application to a subsequent meeting for consideration. So thank you so much. That is me. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Amy, thank you for that. Um, has there any correspondence been received, Ms. Wade? One, excuse me, sorry. One letter of no objection was received from the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. 
and one letter of no objection was received from the District of Muskoka provided that appropriate development control techniques are used to implement the recommendations of the environmental impact assessment prepared by Mikulski Nielsen Associates dated July 19, 2018, as well as measures to address phosphorus management, including stormwater management, vegetation retention, and replanting are addressed. Two letters of support were received from Steve and Francis Kareem and Klaus Altvetter, and one letter of objection was received from Paul Green. All right, thank you very much. Are the applicants or any other members of the public present and wanting to make any comments? Here's Mr. Green, a member of the public is in attendance. But I'm not seeing the applicant, Your Worship. Okay, thank you. Mr. Green, do you have any comments you wish to make? Hi, my screen just went black, so I'm not sure if you can see me. We can. Oh, great. Um, my only comments are uh, like I, I made a lot of comments at the last hearing. Um, I trust that you've had time to read my latest uh, email. And um, my comments are just, uh, if you have any questions uh, to me, uh, there's even more that's gone on that I haven't included. I understand that, you know, nothing's gonna be decided here today. Um, but uh, since everything was signed off on, uh, there's already been modifications made to the boathouse. And we basically uh, were led to believe that um, once, uh, we made major concessions. The two docks at the front of the boathouse um, never had permits. And um, so we felt we made major concessions. We just wanted to be done with this. We, we agreed uh, only to move the one dock a few feet, like four feet over, which still quite honestly is quite tight. And uh, material changes were made to the boathouse. It's all in my letter. And uh, we just can't see uh, how um, we, we can move forward with this. Anyway, that's all the comment I wanted to make. And uh, I, I invite any questions that anybody might have. That, that was it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And I can confirm that uh, your correspondence was uh, distributed to uh, all of council uh, yesterday. Okay, so that's great. Thank you. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our council and councilors Jarvis followed by Cooper will lead off the discussion, please. Thank you. I remember visiting this site uh, last time around and in high water, I don't know if anybody's got a, a picture of the overhead, but the, um, the south of that property is uh, basically um, landfill. There are um, uh, uh, walls put up, uh, barriers put up to try and keep all that land in where all the grass is. Uh, this property is significantly smaller or was before the septic bed went in. The septic bed itself uh, was underwater in, in the high water period, uh, which is when I visited it. Uh, either, sorry, it was, it was at water level, excuse me. I remember uh, taking this to our um, CBO at the time, and uh, we were advised that the septic system was looked at at that time. I don't understand how a septic bed uh, that is at water level is not compromised. But over and above that, that land uh, that is shown as lawn is really uh, introduced landmass to that island. And I think we've got to be very, very careful about accepting any thing further in the way of uh, revisions to this property. Um, this guy's gone on a little bit too long already. Uh, his coverage is significant already. And I am very concerned for that septic system uh, in a high water period. So um, Ali, for your benefit, I think a, a visit out to that island is essential, and uh, yeah, the survey will tell you that that island is significantly smaller than what we see in the uh, in the overheads right now. And uh, I would not be in favor of any further development whatsoever. Anyway, right. I, I, know. I caution you, Councillor Jarvis, not to make any decisions until a full report is in front of you. I, I appreciate that. Yes, you're right, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. 
no intention in terms of uh, indicating how I vote, but I think this is way out of line. I'm allowed to say that, and uh, and I'll tell you why I think it's out of line is uh, all the reasons that were just presented by Councillor Jarvis. Uh, I have also been by this site, and uh, I can see that. Um, in fact, I was looking at this uh, property uh, with uh, the head of geomatics at the District of Muskoka as an example of um, a manufactured island. You can see there are square corners. Uh, islands don't have squares or, or 90 degree corners. It, this has been infill and you can ac actually see it from the aerial photo that you uh, provided. Uh, there are lumps there, which are little shoals originally. So I'm really suggesting this, and that is that uh, when the survey is done, I'd like to see a survey that demonstrates what was there and how much landfill has been done because uh, I'm not aware of um, any bylaws that we have that allow people to do landfill and then put a septic system in. I think that's, uh, I, th I think that's very problematic. And I also am very sympathetic to a lot of the comments that Mr. Green has made in his, uh, his uh, communication with us. So um, I, I don't get it uh, and I really don't support it, uh, but I'm not suggesting how I will vote. I'm just saying, I don't like what I'm seeing here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rianco, please. Well, my comments is mainly on the process. Um, I'm somewhat curious why this is in front of us when it doesn't sound like to me the application's complete. Um, I see staff is recommending deferral. Well, they shouldn't even come to us if, if the staff is not, doesn't have a complete file. Why would this application be coming to us now? And secondly, what we received in our package is no no diagrams, no pictures, nothing. All we got is a a, a picture of an of a, a drawing of an island in the middle of nowhere. It, the package sent to us here is lacking in a lot of detail for us to make any kind of decision. So hopefully, when this comes back, that's a complete application. There are sufficient photographs and diagrams and so on to understand uh, the concerns that Councillor Edwards and Jarvis uh, have, and also Mr. Green and so on, because I don't have enough information even here to further, to, 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 to agree with the deferral. It shouldn't even be uh, in our agenda today. Mr. Duff. Uh Thank you. Mr. You, uh, your worship to Councillor Wienko. This one was a bit of a weird one because it was originally brought forward in 2018. So in 2018, they did an analysis based on no survey. We should have had a survey back then. Um, since it was deferred last time, it stayed an active application and the applicant requested this year to bring it forward. So we brought it forward. However, um, the direction that council may provide right now will allow us to go back and and get the survey that should have been provided in 2018. All new applications now, we don't accept them without it. So we're, we're talking about an incomplete file. That's what I'm worried about. We're wasting our time today talking about an in, incomplete file. And you, uh, have, you have 30 days after you receive an application to deem it complete or incomplete. So that would have had to have happened in 2018. And it didn't happen then, is that what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, okay. that, you're correct, it didn't happen. So we're using this um, direction from council to ask for that survey. And then the survey will hopefully allow us to do an analysis of Mr. Green's concerns um, and the concerns council has expressed about where the high watermark is on this property. Okay, and, and when it comes back, I think we need a lot more information in our package to uh, uh, make the final decision. Yeah. Councilor Cooper, you have an additional remark? Yes, I'd just like to uh, thank um, Councilor Wianco for his comments and my name changed to Edwards. Um, we're not exactly the same person, a former Councilor Edwards, but uh, so the name is Cooper, thank you. I totally missed that one. Councillor Hazelton, please. Uh, thank you. Um, in the request that you have, this is a, a question to uh, to Jen or to Ali. 
um, you're asking for a plan of survey. Um, can you also include um, elevations of the uh, the flattened area? Um, because I think it would be useful for us as council to know um, if in fact the septic bed is in fact, uh, the bottom of the septic bed is uh, one point or 177, sorry, 178.4 uh, above, obviously the, uh, it's clearly above the high water mark. It's gotta be a meter above the high water mark, the bottom of the septic system tile bed. And um, I'm not sure um, based on what I've seen and uh, Councillor Jarvis brought this information forward that um, the uh, the septic system couldn't possibly be uh, that kind of elevation. So uh, we have that information included in the survey so that we can have a full a full set of information on which to make decisions. Thank you. Ms. Nicholson, I see your hand. Thank you, Your Worship. Just a quick note on the septic. It was approved um, in 1992 by the MOE. I'm sure that might be a little more help. What was and wasn't applicable at that time. 1992. Yep. Thank you. Um, and I, I, I'm going to suggest to staff uh, when you're going from the survey, I think any historical references to the, that island and the you know earlier development might be very useful for us in, in making our uh, decision, whatever it may be, um, in, including uh, the, the expansion of the island. Any other, Councillor Cooper, you've already had two turns, but I'll give you a third one because others haven't raised their hand quickly enough. You've only had a couple, so there you go. You can catch up. Um, so I just simply uh, reinforcing your point and I wanted to make that point is that uh, I think we really need to see the total story from, from some time ago to today. And uh, MOE is one approving authority, but so is the Township of Georgian Bay is another approving authority. So um, I don't know why we would have even approved this in 1992. So just a point of clarification there. And uh, I hope we see some really significant details around this property. Thank you. All right. The motion I have in front of me is moved by Councilor Rianko, seconded by Councilor Bocek. Be it resolved that Council receives Development Service Report 2022-82, and this matter be brought back pending applic applicant submitting a new plan of survey signed by an Ontario land surveyor. Um, and before I call for the vote, uh, Councillor Bocek, you do not require to show yourself or your vote unless we have a split vote where your vote's necessary. So if, if everybody else is voting in favor, and let, unless you want to show yourself, you do not have to. And with that, oh, Councillor Jarvis, you have a comment before I go ahead. Yes, it, is it necessary within the uh, recommendation to also uh, require uh, hi the historical information that we've just been discussing be included in any uh, future uh, submission? We've given that direction to Council. Um, so I'll go to our planning department. Do you need that in, 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 a, in, a, um, in a, a resolution? Written form, yeah. Um, through you, your worship to Councillor Jarvis, we've heard your direction. I don't think we need it in a resolution, uh, but we can make sure the applicant provides us so we have the context we need uh, to provide the information for you to make a decision. Okay, so we got to go back to at least 92, if not before that, right? Okay. I'll note it in my notes. All those in favor? And that is Kerry. Thank you very much. And we have one final item in our zoning bylaw of amendments applications. This is Z 18 30 for Four Island 840. And to our planning department. Okay, it's me again. Hello, me again. Please go ahead. Allie here, long time, no see. Um, okay, so I'll be taking you through application Z1830, GBI Limited for the lands located at 4 Island 840. 
this is another zoning bylaw amendment application um, to facilitate the expansion of a legal non-complying dwelling by permitting an increase in GFA, a reduced front yard setback for an addition and a reduced setback for a porch. Based on a review of the application and the applicable planning policies, staff are recommending the approval of the application. The subject property is a subdivided island located in South Bay. It has an area of approximately 1.2 hectares and a frontage of approximately 219.7 meters. There is currently two single detached dwellings with decking on the property, as well as one sleeping cabin, three sheds and two docks. The two buildings, the two dwellings were built in 1978 and 1966 and are considered legal structures. The sleeping cabin was built in 1940 and is also considered a legal structure. The three sheds and two docks were existing when the applicant purchased the property in 2002 and the legality of these structures could not be determined at this time, but the building department has been notified. Here's 2018 aerial imagery of the subject property. The property is zoned Shoreline Residential Island Type 1. A site visit conducted by staff on September 23rd identified dense mature vegetation to the north, sparse vegetation to the south, and a rocky shoreline. The surrounding properties in all directions appear to be occupied with detached shoreline residential development. So a quick recap on the file. This is another application that stems back from 2018. It was brought forward to permit an addition to a legal non-complying dwelling by permitting an increase in the GFA and reduced setbacks for the proposed addition. Public comments were heard at the meeting at that time and concerns were raised with regards to the dwelling size, setbacks and water quality. And then the recommendation at that time was that staff consider the public comments and prepare a recommendation report to be brought back to a subsequent meeting. So due to circumstances surrounding the COVID-19 pandemic, the applicant decided to postpone the application, but wishes to resume the process now. Upon further review of the application, staff have revised the previous requested amendments to what you have before you um, in order to be more explicit and clear about the requests for the proposed development. The subject property is designated rural lands in the PPS. It's designated waterfront in the district official plan and is also identified as being located on a cold water lake and having moderate to high archaeological potential. In the township official plan, it is designated waterfront within the Honey Harbor Coastal Waterfront Community, is located within the South Bay Special Policy Area and is surrounded by unidentified fish habitat. Based on a review of the relevant policies, planning staff are of the opinion that the application conforms to the general intent of the PPS, the district official plan, and the township official plan. So here's a zoning matrix for the proposed development. The three provisions that the applicant is seeking relief from is the GFA provisions, as well as the front yard setback requirements for both the proposed addition and the porch. In terms of the GFA, the shoreline residential island type one zone does not have any specific restrictions on GFA. However, since the structure is a legal non-complying structure, it's subject to the expansion provisions outlined in section 411E of the zoning bylaw. Since the dwelling is set back less than 10 meters from the high water mark, it is subject to section 411EI1 of the zoning bylaw, which limits GFA expansion to 25%. Um, the existing GFA is 46 square meters and they are permitted an expansion of 11.5 square meters to adhere to that 25% expansion policy. The applicant is propo proposing an addition of 48 square meters and a screened porch of 18 square meters for a total expansion of 66 square meters, which equates to 143.4%. The total GFA of the existing and proposed development would be 112 square meters. While the proposed GFA increase exceeds the 25%, staff are of the opinion that the overall size of the structure is modest, being at 112 square meters, and that the cumulative impact of the development is consistent with the development on the surrounding properties. As such, staff are of the opinion that the proposed expansion is reasonable. The next required amendment deals with the front yard setbacks of both the proposed porch and the addition. The SRI one zone requires a 20 meter front yard setback for the dwelling and an 18 meter setback for the porch. The legal non-complying expansion provisions do not permit, permit further encroachment into the existing front yard. 
So here's the site plan. You can see that the existing dwelling has a front yard setback of 2.7 meters. That's here. The proposed addition will have a setback of 4.1 meters, which is here. And then the porch will have a setback of 4.08 meters, which is down here. So the location of the existing dwelling and the narrow shape of the lot doesn't provide an opportunity to maintain a 20 meter setback in all directions. Additionally, the majority of the expansion will be taking place to the rear of the existing building and no part of the proposed expansion will further reduce the existing front yard setback of 2.7 meters. As such, staff are of the opinion that the request for reduced setbacks for the addition and porch is reasonable. So here are renderings of the proposed development. Staff note that the development will not increase in height from what's already existing and that it will maintain the existing height of 3.5 meters. The next few slides are of some site photos from the site visit conducted by staff. This is from the water approaching the property. the existing cottage and proposed addition footprint at the south, as well as the existing cottage and proposed addition footprint at the east. The shoreline to the north of the existing cottage, the view of the west side of the cottage from the water, view of the subject property from the water, And based off our analysis, staff recommend approval of the zoning bylaw amendment Z1830 for the lands located at 4 Island 840. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. I'm wondering if there's any correspondence on file. <clears throat> one letter of no objection was received from the Chilliam Lakelands District School Board and one letter of no objection was received from the District of Muskoka provided that appropriate development control techniques be used to implement a stormwater management and impact mitigation measures. Thank you. Do we know if the applicant or any members of the public are present who might wish to comment on this file? I see Mr. Bruce would like to be moved over. I also see a Bob Bruce, possibly related. Hello. Mr. Bruce. Hi, how are you? Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Town Council, Town Staff. Just to clarify quickly, GBI Limited is the holding company which our, our family, the Bruce family, has the property in. So it was set up 20 years ago for I think tax purposes at the time. Um, um, thank you for taking the time to consider our application. I also want to uh, thank the town staff for preparing the report. Um, I learned a lot reading through it. Um, this isn't something I do all the time. Uh, just a note of, you know, our plan, the ideas, to, the, the cottage has been there, you know, for 50 years and it's, it's really time to, to update it uh you know in to be more modern and um so our feeling was you know so so the proposal is basically to modernize the cottage we have a proposal that's modest uh, you know to increase the floor area um and i think that's about it i mean we've been up there a long time and it's important to us that aesthetically and environmentally it, you know it fits with the overall um sort of bay Honey Harbor area. So we were we were really conscious of that when we put it together. I have our our architect Michael Scott on the call who can also answer any questions that you might have. Uh, Michael also has a cottage in Honey Harbor on the North Bay side. So he also knows the area very well. Um, thank you. All right, thank you. Does anyone else wish to make any comments? I see uh, Mr. Myers and Mr. Scott. Well, I'm Len Myers. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I, I'm. We own Lowney Island, or we own my wife and I uh, own half of Lowney Island, and her grandfather I think, bought it in 1927. So we've been there a long time. 
And really, I wanted to see how this process worked because someday we're going to probably be asking for, you know, expansion of our cottage. I do have one general comment. I can see where, you know, the smaller properties have a problem with the frontage and the setbacks. And I'm not objecting to any of this. Um, but over the years, as property has been redeveloped around us, it seems like it's a very easy thing for people to get that setback waived. And we do object to that general fact that if they have the property, then move the cottages back, you know, make them comply. You know, a number of them around what we call the back of the island have, have gotten those uh, setbacks waived, but they have a lot of property. They could have complied. General comment. Hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for your input. We appreciate it. Any other, Mr. Scott? Um, I don't think I have much to add to what Jeff has said, except just if you looked at the photographs that were presented um, as well as part of the presentation, uh, it's worth noting that all the development we're proposing is on the, the island side and should be screened by the existing trees. So the, the visual impact from the shoreline is as minimal as we could make it. All right, thank you. If that's it from, um, I'll call it the general public. I will now turn it over to um, council. And Councillor Cooper, I see your hand. And uh, thank you, Ali, for your report. Um, very interesting. I do have um, some questions. Uh, and, and really, we're looking at this in sort of what I would call a little bit of isolation in that we're looking at one cottage, one development, et cetera. We've heard information about the entire area, but, but really it's sort of zoomed in on development of one cottage. But there are two dwellings, as I understand it, on this property. Um, and in current terms, you can't have two dwellings, but uh, so they're there. So the question then becomes um, what sort of, what would happen when in two, five years, 10 years, when another application comes forward to expand another dwelling? So that we really end up with two expanded dwellings on, on a property, which is really supposed to have one. So that's a comment uh, generally, but more specifically, um, do we have two separate septic systems for these two dwellings um, that can handle um, all the uh, septage that uh, could come from this? Um, I, that's one thing. I've also can note in the past that where we've had circumstances like this, there's been a requirement for a separate use of severance. In other words, each caught each uh, sev uh, a severance that allows for each lot to have a dwelling on it, as opposed to a non, uh, no, no sef separate use of severance. And I'd like to know why we wouldn't uh, be uh, requesting that to happen. I can point to another, a number of examples for our planning staff uh, where, where there's been applications and, and separate sef severance uses applied. We've had other examples like this uh, in the Honey North end of Honey Harbor where it was denied because frankly, two dwellings on one property that doesn't uh, support two, two dwellings is, is concerning. So I, I would like to uh, have a, um, an indication as to why we're focusing on just one, as, as one aspect to the septic and severant uses. So there's, there's sever separate uses severance. So there's really three, three things there that I'd like to understand. Thank, Thank you. you. To our planning department. Who wants to go first? Ms. Cadet. Uh, that was a, a lot, uh, Councillor Cooper. Hopefully I don't miss everything. Um, with regards to the septic, we will coordinate with building. Um, Kaylee, I'm not sure if you are uh, if you have any insight into the uh, two, two septic policy or, or previous procedure that was applied when there were two dwellings on a property. Um, would you, would you like me to answer that? Yes, I'm, not, I'm not currently sure exactly what's there to serve both. Um, it could be one septic to serve both. There's no requirement for it to be two. Um, depending on what the size of the buildings are, we all know what uh, comes in in the size of a septic. So when they do, if this is approved and they do apply for a permit, whatever septic systems are on there will need to serve what is on that property as a whole. Thank you. 
Um, with regards to possible expansion of the second dwelling, um, as far as we understand, that's not being considered right now, but if they were to request that in the future, um, they would submit an application and we would conduct a, a new analysis that incorporates any previous expansion, which may include this one if it, if it gets approved today. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Mr. Bruce, if you have any idea of your whether you have one or two septic systems on your island. Yes, um, there's one septic system on the island, which was replaced, I believe, in 2007 or 2008. Uh, we had White's contracting do it, and I, I believe it was permitted and inspected. The cottage, the second uh, dwelling, has also been inspected by the city on a couple of occasions. I do believe on the plan, um, we're not adding any actual plumbing fixtures uh, to the plan. So it's not, you know, there's not a huge, um, Michael can maybe confirm for me there. Uh, as well, in terms of the law coverage, we're well under, even with the two buildings, we're well under what the law coverage is allowable for uh, under the planning. Um, so I think we're, we went from 2% to five or three to 10 or something like that. So I, I don't know that that helps, but you know we don't have any plans, in fact, quite the opposite to build large structures on uh, the island. Um, so, and I think the existing house is about, has a footprint of about 800 square feet. Thank you for the additional information though. I can't help but note that there was, uh, I don't see a, a septic system on the, the survey that was in our report. Well, my um, questions aren't finished. They are, haven't been answered. Or we're, we, we're still working on them. I thought we were finished. Um, so, um, Mr. Dad, are you finished? Are you, okay, Councillor Cooper, additional question. It's not an additional question. It's the questions that I put forth. There were three of them. Uh, and a, but just before we get to the third one, which was a se separate use of severance, which I was uh, suggesting, was that um, I still have some discomfort approving something like this without having something very specific on a septic system and and the ability to handle things. It's not just about the number of um, appliances you have in a building. It's the number of people that are, the building can accommodate. In other words, how many can live in all those properties and uh, so and buildings, uh, sleeping cabins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that becomes a, a bigger number and I don't see any information about that. So I wanna in, ensure that we, um, before we give an approval, we have a very clear picture on the septic side of things, and and if it's uh, can handle it, fine. But if it can't, we need to know about it. That's my second question. My third question is what was about separate uses severance. Is there any reason that we shouldn't be requesting that so that uh, we can control the um, the dwelling expansion for building two if it comes forward, which it could very well do. Thank you. Uh, that's for you, Jen. I guess. Mr. Depp. Um, through you, your worship to Council Cooper, I see Kaylee's hand up, so I'll let her answer question two, but with regards to question three, a possible severance in the future, we would deal with that if it were applied for, but my understanding is there's no desire by the applicants to sever the property. Uh, is that, does that answer your question? No, because what I'm really saying is maybe we should be requiring a separate severance um, so that uh, we don't have two dwellings on one property. Thank you. Uh, they're both legally existing structures, so we don't have the power to compel someone to sever their property. Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't think we're looking at it in... in um, I, I'm sorry, I don't agree. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kaylee, if you could take the septic question, uh, number two for yep. council. Yep, of course I can, of course I can. So this this comes up and it, it it's a question with every addition or every new cottage that is applied for through the planning process. Um, what you need to know is we don't have all the information in front of us when we are asked to comment. So we're coming up with a general comment on this. What you need to know is that 
Um, and what we like the applicants to know is that no permit, whether this gets approved or not, no permit is issued unless the septic um, is big enough to serve what they are proposing and what is existing on the property. Whether you approve an application or not has no bearing on that. Um, they do not get a permit unless the septic and everything in accordance with that meets the Ontario Building Code. Thank you. Um, Councilor Jarvis, please. Yeah, I too had questions about that second uh, cottage on the island. Uh, I understand Jen's uh, uh, comments that it's it's legally pre-existing, um, but the current building that, to which the proposed uh, work is being done is legal non-complying. I've got that correct, right, Ali? Okay, so legal non-complying. I'm finding myself in um, sympathy with uh, is it Len Meyer's comments about the fact that. Um, I think our original, I think that the intent to a legal non-complying, any application to a legal non-complying uh, building was to include efforts to bring that uh, structure building property development into compliance. And, um, and we're not finding a lot of that going on with the applications we're getting. And this is a perfect example of that. So I'm having trouble with the concept I, I, and the, the building, the new building looks good. Uh, the idea makes sense. There's, the, the, you know, from the standpoint of the total land mass, uh, it's not a big deal. But the fact is, it's not in compliance. Uh, if it were a new build, we wouldn't be allowing it. Well, sorry, we wouldn't be considering it uh, because of the setbacks. And we've got to try and figure out how we can, or how he can, or he's got to figure out how he can with planning, uh, bring that building that he's changing into compliance. And if he's rebuilding it, it should be pretty easy. Build it further back somewhere, uh, maybe up where the uh, other structure already is. Uh, I don't like the idea of two cottages on one property. I think that's already been dealt with here. Uh, and we've got to, I think we've got to look at that um, from, a, a, from a, a higher level here, uh, as opposed to just saying, well, it's, you know, it's historically in place, yada, yada, yada. Well, yeah, but they're making changes. Let's try and get things into compliance while these changes are being proposed. Uh, those are my comments. Ms. Bradford. Uh, for you, Your Worship, to Councillor Jarvis, the intent of um, the zoning bylaw is to allow some flexibility for expansion of legally existing non-complying dwellings. Um, it's not to bring them into compliance, just for clarification. And, uh, and I'm going to thank you. I think we need to we need to revi revisit that then. Okay. But I, but I think it's also important to note that any building non-compliant or what uh, or compliant for that matter has a footprint. You know, often trees were cut down or unless it was built in bare rock. And if you ask somebody to take down their cottage and move it to a new location, in many cases that means in the new location they got to cut down trees that otherwise would survive, and the old location is going to be bare because they used to have a cottage on it. So I think we have to be a little bit careful sometimes what we wish for. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, CAO Mariotti who raised his hand before I go to Councillors Mianko and then Douglas. Thank you, Mayor Kutia. Um, morning, Council. I'm not a planner, so I, I will uh, maybe ask Jen to, uh, to clarify what, what I'm about to say or, or if I'm totally way out of left field. Uh, but it, in essence, my understanding is that a legally non-complying uh, property or structure is, is legal right now. So it may have been built in the 40s or in the 50s before even Georgian Bay Township was, uh, was, was here. Uh, however, for all intents and purposes, that building is legal. And so any changes that are being proposed to a legally non-complying or non-conforming building should be looked as those changes alone and not, and not reverse back time. Um, because as you can appreciate, I'm sure there are many, many buildings and cottages out there on the islands, multiple cottages on islands that, that exist, multiple families that have cottages on islands. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope uh, trying to bring all these old buildings back into the current standards of, of compliance per the, you know, per the building code or planning out or whatever, whatever you want to call it. So uh, I, I urge council to really look at any proposed changes based on mm -hmm. the existing structure that is, you know, legally non
non-conforming or non-complying. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rianco, please. Well, I think I'm uh, agreeing with uh, Councillor Jarvis on this idea of having two cottages on one property. Um, I think I would like to bring the property in compliance. If somebody was to ask to uh, build another cottage on an island, well, I mean on, a, on any land, a second cottage on, an, on, a, on a piece of land and keep the old cottage, we would say, no, you'd have to turn that into a bunkie. So here's a situation where we're on the property, there's two cottages, they're asking for changes to one of them. Why can't we ask that the other uh, cottage be turned into a bunkie? And it's not that it has to be torn down. All, all you have to do is remove the kitchen and then it becomes a bunkie. So is that a possible, is, is that a reasonable request in this application that uh, the second cottage be turned into a bunkie and the kitchen be removed? Is that a condition that we can put on this application? Ms. Godet, please. So this is a zoning bylaw amendment. So there are no conditions. Um, if it were a variance, you could put conditions in, but uh, we don't do zoning with conditions. So there's absolutely no way that we can bring this property into compliance uh, with only having one cottage and a bunkie. Is that what you're saying? We can't use a condition uh, to do that. Um, if council wanted to go that route, uh, the only option would be to deny the application. Um, Mr. Bruce, I'm not sure if you have anything to add about your feelings about conversions. Well, I don't, we're not going to we're not going to agree to that you know the building is you know the property has been the way it has been for 50 years or some odd long before we've uh, bought it the proposal that we're putting forward is far more modest than a lot of the stuff that i'm seeing going up uh, even on our own bay there's some fairly lavish renovations that i'm sure didn't uh didn't um sort of uh didn't um or required uh, amendments, um, including one uh, one building in South Bay by Georgian Bay Landing, where they destroyed the entire shoreline and built basically a palace and a yacht dock. I don't know how that got approved, but I'm being challenged here, you know, to add a few square feet to a building in an island that's been there forever. You know, to your point about finding another building site, there is another building site there that we can use. It's in the forest. And we could use that as of right, but the second uh, we do that, and we can, because of the size of the property, we can actually put up a fairly large uh, building there. I think in the thousands of square feet, if I'm if I'm correct in understanding the law, but that would require clearing that forest out, which is what we're trying not to do. The fact to go further, we actually made this plan. There's about an 80 or 100 year old oak sitting right next to this building. And we, we adjusted the plan so that we were building around that oak tree so that it would stay up there. And, you know, so I kind of look at, you know, to everybody's point and even, even to Lou's point or Len's point, I'm sorry, there is a lot of incredible um, development going on in the Bay over the last five years or so. I have no idea how it's being approved. We're not trying to jump on that bandwagon um, you know, and so uh, to be totally honest, we're not going to turn any building into a bunkie. That would take the that would make the value of the property plummet. There's there's bunkies that have been turned into cottages and and dwellings all over the bay. I boat around the bay all the time. There's a bunkie currently that's on stilts, hanging over the water on on North Bay. You know, I'm seeing a lot of development on smaller properties. There's there's literally islands in South Bay on plots of land that are a fraction of ours that are fully developed right up to the waterline and they've got permits to build and to go up. You know, we made an intentional decision not to apply to go, go higher. We made an intentional decision to, to be very modest about what we want to do. And, you know, I guess severance is a choice, but then we have to come back and, and make the same application, you know, it, just on a single property. This property is shared with myself and my family. It's it's 
it's all be us. It just doesn't, by doing anything on this island, it doesn't change who's there. It's, it's always been us for the last 20 years and we, we continue to, you know, it's our plan to move forward that way. Um, all I can say is I think that this adds value. You know, we have an old cottage that's mostly falling apart. We want to clean it up. We want to modernize it. We want to improve the septic system. We want to, you know, there's, I think there's a phosphate control element to the new permits. You know, that's something that will make a difference for everybody. And I think in terms of, you know, the impact on other people, it's like, I can send you a hundred examples of places that are far more lavish and far more impactful that seem to be getting built. There was just another piece of land that was just cleared, probably about four or five acres of forest was cleared near Georgian Bay beside the other one. So, you know, I, I, I understand that we don't want to have maybe a million buildings on every property, but this is one that was always like this. This is part of the history of the Bay. It's not, it's not something we're proposing as new and we wouldn't, we wouldn't. That's, I, I, that's, that's where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilor Wink, were you finished with your remarks and should I move on and come back to you or? Um, Councilor Douglas, please. I uh, think Sydney had something to say to that comment, was she? Did you want to speak before me? <laughs> Sorry? Sydney, I think Sydney had a, or Jen rather, had a, a question before me, so I don't know whether she wanted to. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, thanks, Councillor Douglas. I just wanted to um, expand upon points that have been made here that these are legally existing structures. So we have no power through this application to compel them to take a building down or convert it. We're just looking at can we, should we let them expand it by about 700 square feet? So I just wanted to kind of bring us back um, into focus what the actual application is asking for. That was it. Thank you. Councilor Douglas. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, it's, it's, it's very difficult because of the history of um, our township and, and uh, what, what's being built back in the 50s. I mean, we see it all the time and it is a hard decision to make on what to do with those buildings and you know, ask them to come into compliance. So uh, I do have mixed feelings about how this application is, is and would like to see it, it comply. But the reality is we have many, many properties that are in this position. And I think until we uh, change some of our uh, perhaps bylaws or information or zoning bylaws or, or whatever, I don't think we can compel these people as has been said to, to uh, change one into a cabin. However, there is one thing that I, I would hope, hope would come back to council on it. It's just making me think about it through this particular application. And that has to do with the septics that uh, septic system that uh, Councillor uh, Cooper brought up. Um, you know, presently we work off of, I believe, and, and perhaps this is more a question to Kaylee, we work off of uh, units in the building. Um, however, the one thing that's going to come up soon, and, and I unfortunately will not be a part of the council to um, work with this, is the rental aspect. When you have two properties like this, yes, now it is a family property, but should it ever sell and become uh, what we were seeing a lot of, rentals, it's this, the units almost don't make a difference because some of these rentals are packing in, you know, huge crowds of people on an ongoing basis. So I'm, I, I think it's not really a question, but it is something that I would hope our council will think about and will bring, bring back to council at some point. Um, just a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Meyer, it's like you to respect that this is now a council discussion. Okay, I, I, did, I didn't know if I'd be out of order or not, so that's fine. Thank I won't. You. I won't call you out of order, but at this point, it's a council discussion. Yeah. Well. I, well. Primarily, I wanted to apologize to everyone for opening up this can of worms. I. I do not object to the application on file, and the family does not. We understand the circumstances, but the primary, you know, I saw this as a forum, and I think uh, Jeff has also addressed it. Is these new construction, which seem to us should comply, and yet they get waivers. 
that's the future. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to make a couple of comments and then we'll, we'll go. I see Councillors Cooper and Jarvis want to jump in for a second round. Um, Councillor Bochuk, though, did you want to say something uh, before we go to a second round? You're muted, sir. Yeah, thank you for uh, letting me speak. I don't seem to have any issue with this application at all, and I would support the application. Thank you. Thank you. I find when I look at this um, that I, I'm a little concerned that uh, while I, we absolutely have rules around um, not having two dwellings on a property, I, I look at the survey and I, I don't know how we're, we would sever this into two properties which have a dwelling on each one of them just because of the way the location of the two dwellings. So I don't think that's a practical approach. Um, I, I don't doubt that our building department will make sure that there's more than enough septic capacity for the number of, of bedrooms and uh, unit uh, appliances and all that uh, that are attached. Um, but I'm also, I, I think it, I'm also very concerned that we have a, what is really a modest addition. I mean, when, when the building is all said and done, I think it's 1200 square feet or something like that, because I'm afraid I'm more in square feet than square meters. Um, and, you know, the buildings are nowhere near the, the limit for um, lot coverage and things like that. Uh, and, and, and I think we have to take into account that we have a lot of guidelines for what we can do in the future, but we don't want to, I, I, you know, counter to Councillor Jarvis, I don't think we want to bring everybody into compliance to the current rules and regulations, because that would mean 80% of the buildings stocked in uh, that's more than 80, more than say 40 years old would all have to be torn down and moved. And I don't think that's an appropriate approach to take. I really don't. Uh, I think um, we, we don't want to see people who want to put an addition on their cottage have to move it uh, hundreds of feet back because um, they just they, it happened to be built before our current bylaws. I, I think we have to be a little bit careful on, on that. I find myself with this per particular case, uh, I, I think the request is quite modest and, and reasonable, but my question to our planning staff is, because we're doing a zoning bylaw amendment, is this not the opportunity to legalize what's there by uh, recognizing it in the zoning bylaw instead of simply saying uh, it's legal non-compliant? Uh, and and, I'm, I'm, and I'm, my question to planning then is why didn't we, in the proposed zoning bylaw amendment, uh, why didn't you include uh, recognition of the fact that this particular island or section of island has two dwellings on it? Um, I can take that one, Your Worship. So um, the proposed expansion is only for the one dwelling. So our zoning bylaw only addresses the location of the existing building there and the proposed addition to it. Since that second dwelling is not proposed to be changed to this application, we don't address it through zoning, um, which means the advantage of that is we're not impacting the legality of that second structure. So right now they have rights under the Planning Act to um, keep what they have and we can't touch it. But if they wanted to, for example, take that other structure down, um, there are some, some legality to how long they have to replace that structure. But essentially, if we address that second dwelling in our current zoning bylaw right now through this amendment, they would always be able to have two. In the future, if we don't recognize it, um, they only have the legally existing permissions for that second structure. So it could come down in the future, I hope. That was a convoluted way of, of getting to the point. I hope I 
I answered your question. In other words, not legalizing it is a more conservative approach, if I can put it that way. Yes, because if we were to recognize both, they would always be able to have both. Yeah. Fair enough. All right, thank you. With that, Councillor Cooper, please. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, everyone for all the good input. Um, I just wanted to maybe deal with a couple of what I call red herrings, but uh, <laughs> a meaning that uh, they're really not relevant to this application. And, and uh, I'm not sure that it's even something that uh, um, is being proposed, I don't think, by anybody here. And that is that uh, I don't think we're talking about going out and being proactive on other properties and saying, you're not in compliance, so you got to fix it. I don't think that's what being was being suggested by Councillor Jarvis. I think what we should be saying is if it's non-compliant, why are we making it more non-compliant? So that's my uh, comment about this. Uh, let's just call it what it is. And, and the other thing I'd like to say, is, there's a couple other things. One is that uh, uh, basically there's being references of things that have been built in the past, recently approved. Uh, some of them shouldn't have been improved. And, and I'm certainly sympathetic to the comments from the property owner, but it's irrelevant. Uh, you can't just sit here and point at other things that were uh, insufficiently uh, supervised or handled and uh, say, well, I should be able to do it too. So I just, I think that's a, another red herring. I think we need to deal with the facts. And, and one of the facts it, it we're supposed to deal with and in, in, in really in reference to our CAO's comment is more non-compliance isn't really what we necessarily should be thinking about. We should be thinking about trying to be compliant. And more non-compliance is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. So those are my comments. Thank you. Yep. Councillor Jarvis. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with Councillor Cooper in many respects, but Mayor, I'm finding myself in agreement with you as well and the CAO in that uh, why make this a bigger mess than it already is? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to the cause of the applicant on this. Um, but I think we've got to, from a planning perspective, and in legally non-complying buildings where we are getting further applications, to a, we should be directing the applicants in any way, shape, or form to bring whatever they can into compliance at the time of any reapplication, you know, for any work they're being done. I mean, there may be restrictions, and, and I think the, the, the applicant here has got a good argument in that moving that building back, or Mr. Mayor, you've made the comment, that we could be destroying more, more of the environment in that process than letting the applicant in this case go ahead with what they're proposing, which makes sense. I don't have a, I'm having a trouble being in opposition to those comments. Um, but I think we've got to, from a planning perspective, and uh, consider for f any development on legally non-complying that at any that effort should always be made to bring uh, that type of property into compliance wherever possible. Uh, those are my comments, Jen. I appreciate your comments with regards to that second dwelling. Um, yeah, I'm hoping that uh, it's for future consideration and. Uh, Obviously, planning will know what we're thinking here when uh, anything comes forward on that. Uh, those are my comments. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Douglas. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jarvis actually brought up quite a bit of what I was <coughs> going to mention. Um, again, I, I'm in favor of this application in regards to the fact that, as I said before, we have many of these that are historical back in the 50s, and it is hard to get them into compliance. But I don't feel it's, uh, I think it's entirely unfair that we require somebody to cut down the rest of their bush to move it back. So those are the compromise we have to make when what we're working with from a historical point of view. So I just, um, yeah, I, I think that going forward, if there's some way to bring buildings into compliance where it doesn't destroy our environment, um, that would be, you know, probably the ultimate wish probably for us. But um, this is part of our job is to make those hard decisions. And, and when we see something like this, that's historical and environmentally probably does not make sense to go back and cut the bush. Well, it just doesn't um, to come compliance. Um, then I think uh, the uh, application does make sense. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hazelton. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Um, so I've been um, listening uh, attentively here, and uh, I, I think um, if I could summarize what I uh, what I've picked up on all of this is um, we have a a property owner who um, is living in a community where cottages are being built uh, that are magnitudes larger than what uh, he's asking for. Um, I think what he is trying to do uh, certainly fits uh, with uh, the, the the climate, if you will, and the the uh, the uh, consistency of uh, other properties in the South Bay area. Um, what I hear is that um, uh, he is seeking an opportunity to expand um, this legal non-conforming property, uh, but expand it backwards from shore so it's not going to be um, all that visible. He's not looking to make it a monster height uh, property. Um, and uh, so I think his uh, his selection of his, his location and uh, his um, his desire to uh, to make the additions that he's got uh, is probably the best from an environmental standpoint. Uh, and again, still consistent with the community. Um, I think that uh, he and planning have done a, a good job of of um, assessing the uh, the options and going with the, what I'll call the least offensive uh, option. And I think uh, in fairness, that's uh, what uh, a lot of decisions are going to be in our community. Uh, the least offensive option to be able to expand. And um, and I think uh, this is probably that, and uh, I would be very supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? I have moved by Councillor Jarvis, seconded by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved that Council next bylaw 2022-090 being a zoning bylaw amendment is at 18-30 to permit an increase in gross floor area of 66 square meters, a reduced setback of 4.1 meters for the proposed addition and a reduced setback of 4.08 meters for the screen porch on the lands located at 4 Island 840. All those in favor? One, two, three, four, I'm five, six. That is carried. Thank you. Um, what I'm going to do is propose that we take a, a, a quick break. Um, I'm wondering before everybody runs away, if we could stop the um, streaming and, and the recording for a, a few minutes, uh, Ms. Way. Um, sorry, Your Worship, I provided you incorrect information. We cannot actually stop the stream. So perhaps we can break and then um, CEO Mariotti and I and yourself can have a chat. Okay, um, I'm going to propose a break for now and reconvene at 11.15 uh, before we address uh, the, the next items on our um, agenda. See everybody at 11.15, please. Thank you.
for those who can hear me, it's 1115. You're muted, Your Worship. Yeah, that's just my brain trying to churn away, and I didn't want you to hear all those gears grinding. <laughs> Sounded good to me. Oh, you're such a nice man. <laughs> right now, I see three, four, Councillor Dilla. I think. I think Peter's just off screen, so I think he's hearing us and Ms. Douglas is there. So let's let's roll ahead. And our next item is a bit unusual. It's a motion for reconsideration. And I think before we start discussing that, I think it's important, um, Ms. Way, if you would be kind enough to share with us, let me call it the background of, as to when and how a reconsideration can be put in front of council. Certainly. So a motion for reconsideration, I mean, oh my goodness, I can't speak all of a sudden. A motion for reconsideration is permitted by the Township's procedural bylaw per section F um, under an act or schedule F, sorry, enactments, uh, section one F from there. So a member of council may request a motion for reconsideration on a matter previously decided. So Councillor Bocek provided a request to myself to request a motion for reconsideration for the application said 22-07 lots K and KK Island 139 Johnston for the removal of a hold H2 symbol. This application was defeated at the September 14th, 2022 planning council meeting. A motion for reconsideration shall not be considered after the next regular meeting. This means the only opportunity for application Z22-07 to be reconsidered is at today's planning council meeting. A formal motion to amend shall be confirmed in writing, shall not be directly germane to the question to be received, and may not propose a direct negative to the question. The first, this means that first council must vote on the motion to reconsider without debating the merits or inferiorities of the application. Councillor Bocek is provided an opportunity to address his fellow members in requesting this motion for reconsideration. The mayor will then call the vote for the motion for reconsideration and a majority vote is required for the motion to carry. If the motion for reconsideration fails, then the outcome of resolution P 2022-097 from September 14th is upheld which in this circumstance was a defeated application and nothing changes to the process of the Planning Act. If the motion for reconsideration passes, then the mayor will facilitate the debate on the application for Z22-07 immediately. Council will be provided the opportunity to review the application per standard planning council practices, including asking questions of the planner. Once the debate concludes and the mayor calls for the vote of the application, it has the opportunity to be carried or defeated again. Additionally, if a motion for reconsideration occurs on this resolution, as it is specific to a planning application, it does reset the clock for the appeal period as the application has been heard again. Thank you, Your Worship. All right, thank you very much. So, I have in front of me a motion that reads, moved by Councillor Bocek, signed by Councillor Douglas, be it resolved that Council approves a motion for reconsideration for Planning Council Resolution P-2022-097, regarding the Zoning Bylaw Amendment Z-22-07 for Lots K and KK Island 139. Councillor Bocek, this is your um, motion. Uh, do you wish to speak to it before I see if there's any uh, questions from the rest of council. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the the council meeting in question, I had very poor internet connection and um, was unable to hear the majority of the presentation made by our planning department. 
Um, subsequently, I watched the archived um, video of the council meeting and heard in that um, council meeting the evidence um, that I was looking for and was unable to ask for. Simply put, if you look at your agenda package that was sent to you on this file, the only thing that I'm concerned with on lifting an H is that there is enough uh, land above the high water mark to sustain the build. Um, if you look at the agenda package and you look at the survey, you will see that there's no high water mark written or, or uh, suggested on that. Um, sorry, guys, my head's a little foggy here. I'm under quite a bit of morphine. Um, but basically, it wasn't there. And in review of the archives, it appeared, not only did it appear, there was a big box with an arrow pointing to the contour saying, this is the high water mark. In the agenda package we got, and I'm sure all councillors understand, the survey is so, so small, I expanded it and expanded it and expanded it until I could get right down to it. And there was no high water mark depicted on that survey from our planning department. Subsequently, in, in, um, in reviewing it and talking to our planning department, it was not there. The contour of 177.4 was there, but it was not able for me to be seen. Um, when I looked at the archives, it was the same survey, but a big arrow and box pointing to that contour saying that was the high water mark. I was unable to, to um, get the questions in because I had poor internet service and I made my decision based solely on the package I was given to in the agenda. Um, had I had the benefit of, of, of watching this, um, I, I would have made a different decision. So I've asked for this to come back to council and it's up to council whether they want to revisit it or not. And I will abide by council's decision. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cooper, followed by Councillor Hazelton, please. Thank you, and I'm not, uh, I don't believe it's uh, this particular point that I want to argue the, uh, whether this uh, matter is, uh, should have been approved or not, but I really am uh, more concerned about actually hearing this. And uh, um, I, I'm certainly sympathetic to what I've heard from Councillor Bocek, but I, I want to understand um, because uh, I, I'm not sure I understood exactly what uh, uh, Clark Way was suggesting. Um, when exactly did you say that a reconsideration could be heard uh, during a term of council? Typically, it's um, um, no motion can be brought back during a term of council, or usually half half the term, or something like that. Do, does our bylaw say you can bring it back any old time you like? And if that's the case. We could have been bringing back a ton of stuff and slow down our business to the point of ridiculousness. So I'd like to understand how we avoid that in the future. I've got lots of things I'd like to have reconsidered. So could I have clarification on that, please? Thank you. Um, certainly, Councillor Cooper through Mayor Cousier. A motion for reconsideration can only be brought back at the next regularly scheduled meeting. So once the next meeting is done, there is no more opportunity to bring something back. So this motion, because it was an application that was heard at the September 14th meeting, its only opportunity to be brought back for reconsideration is today's meeting. If the motion for reconsideration does not pass today, pardon the phrase, but it's dead in the water. There's no more opportunity for this to be brought back. Uh, further clarification, please. Um, just, just so our bylaw, is what you just sta stated, not that you can't rehear things in this term over and over and over again, which, you know, it's supposed, what I'm reading in the counselor's handbook, uh, this one right here, uh, it says uh, typically municipalities will not rehear something in a term. We don't have anything like that in our bylaws, is that correct? I agree, Councillor Cooper, that um, generally speaking, 
um, and best practices do state that once a decision is made, it is not brought back. However, the township's procedural bylaw does permit a motion for reconsideration, but only at the next regularly scheduled meeting. So once that next regular scheduled meeting is over, there is no opportunity to bring something back again. So in this circumstance, we are the only, this is the only time that this motion in particular can be brought back. So a uh, final comment is that uh, A, that sounds problematic for the future because we'll be bringing, uh, we could be potentially bringing things back every single next month. In other words, nothing to stop us from doing that. I realize council has to approve hearing it, but I, I caution that and A and B, uh, maybe we need to look at our procedural bylaw because it sounds to me like uh, our process is not really what's typical through most municipalities in Ontario. So that's concerning um, when I read what I'm reading here. And even I think you've acknowledged that uh, maybe we need to think about that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hazelton. <clears throat> yeah, I, I have a question for uh, Clerk Way. Um, in your, uh, you pointed out in the procedural bylaw item FI, um, it has a statement in there talking about materially amended, and I'm not sure that it's worded clearly. Certainly, I'm confused by it, but um, it would it would seem reasonable that you ask for a reconsideration if something has a material uh, material change to it. And I'm wondering, is that the criteria that we are living with here, or does that not apply? And if it doesn't apply, could you help me understand why? Mm -hmm. Ms. Way. Um, in, in this particular circumstance, that caveat doesn't apply. Um, there's, I don't know, eight to 10 points of, you know, what information and, and what part of a motion to reconsider occurs in what circumstances. So motion for reconsideration FI is specific to um, something being brought back in the same meeting over and over again. So if, um, for example, I'm just going to make up a silly scenario. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, um, council voted in favor of everyone having to wear brown boots to every meeting. And um, that's what happened. And um, Councillor Hazelton, you don't like brown boots. You want to wear blue boots. I don't know. Um, and so you ask for a motion for reconsideration. Um, Councillor Douglas then is like, you know what? Yeah, let's talk about this again. And so a motion for reconsideration passes. You debate the item again. And um, again, the decision is made that there are brown boots get passed, blue boots get voted down. You can't then again in the same meeting force a request a motion for reconsideration to discuss the purchasing of blue boots versus brown boots unless someone partway through the meeting goes, oh my goodness, I just found out from the supplier it is impossible to get brown boots because that is information that would materially amend the consideration, right? Otherwise, that motion cannot be reconsidered. Is that clear as mud? So I... Uh, I thank you for your explanation and example. Um, I guess I'm I'm just um, I think we're at a point uh, certainly with this bylaw and based on your dialogue with uh, Councillor Cooper, we probably need to amend this thing um, and and get it aligned with uh, with others. But um, I, I'm a little concerned that we're revisiting something that has no new information being brought forward about it that would suggest a reconsideration and that that's that's my concern anyways i'll pause there thank you thank you um councilor rianko we've had this done before um in, in my career here at, at the dist at the, at the um, township but we've done it many times at the district and I think uh, Councillor uh, Cooper will remember that we did it during uh, discussions on council makeup. I think that came back a couple of times to be consideration the following uh, month. So it is built into uh, the district uh, procedural bylaw by also. And the other issue is um, 
I don't know if this is in our procedural uh, uh, bylaw, but I'll, but it definitely in the district is that an issue uh, once discussed um, and, and we, we, we get uh, past the next meeting, an issue cannot be brought back on the table for six months. Um, so uh, that also exists, and I don't know if it exists in our uh, township procedural bylaw, but it definitely exists up at the district. So we're just following basically uh, uh, district's procedures on this. Councilor Douglas. Thank you. Um, I, I actually think it's a good thing to have into our bylaws, and I'm quite satisfied that Councilor Borchek has given us uh, good reason um, to reconsider this. You know, we have to remember that we are in a little bit different situation than we were a number of years ago. We we're trying to do Zoom meetings, and quite frankly, I for one, and I'm sure other people have had problems with internet connections. So you, sometimes you miss things, and you know, I think the the reasoning behind this from Councilor Bocek, I I can agree with, and I don't see any problem with this at all. Um, I have to sympathize with the fact that we don't always get to hear absolutely everything. Uh, and he has, uh, I think he's pleaded his case quite well as to why, and I, I have no issue with this at all. All right, I'm not seeing any other comments. Um, would you like me to reread the, the uh, motion? And then I'm gonna say all those in favor of reconsideration. One, two, three, four, and I make five. So that's that has carried five to seven, five to two, you know what I mean? So now that means we are gonna revisit um, the, the motion. And I'm just gonna repeat what the motion was and then we'll get into the discussion. Um, and I have moved by Councillor Bocek, uh, second by Councillor Wienko, be it resolved that Council enacts bylaw 2022-095 be in a zoning bylaw amendment Z22-07 to lift a holding H2 symbol on lands legally described as Island 139 part lots K and KK uh, uh, on registered plan 35R10523 part two in Cognizant Coastal Waterfront Community. So basically the lifting of a hold on this property. Um, so I, I guess at this point, we just go straight into the discussion unless anybody needs a reminder of the case, but uh, we have our, our planner here if that's the case. And I'll start with Councillor Hazelton, please. Thank you, Mayor. I would, uh, I would actually just like to uh, suggest that we expedite the session. It looks like uh, everybody's already uh, entrenched in their views and uh, you should just go ahead and call the vote. There's probably no point in discussing it. Um, and uh, that's my opinion. Okay. Any other councillor, councillor Jarvis? Yeah, I was looking at this and as an opportunity to talk about the lifting of holds in general, uh, but I'll, 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 I will restrict my uh, comments to the specific application. Um, I know I voted in favor of not lifting the hold on this one. Um, and I think it imperative that we, uh, that understanding that the um, putting in an uh, ICB on holds, which was a recommendation at the previous meeting, um, in this case could have, in my mind, could have collateral damage. And that's why I voted against the, in, imposing the ICB. Uh, and in reviewing, re-reviewing. There wasn't a vote for or against an ICB. This was You're a, right, there was not. I apologize. This is a specific application to Sorry. lift a hold. I apologize. Um, I'm just I'm welcoming the opportunity to reconsider this application is what I was getting at. Uh, the information that has come in from the owner since then has changed my point of view with regards to the application itself. Um, and uh, Again, um, I think uh, lifting a hold has implications. I understand that, um, but I would like to reconsider this one, and I'm I'm glad that uh, Councillor Brocheck brought it back before us. Thank you. Uh, again, I apologize for my comments, Councillor Cooper.
Well, I'm uh, going to make it very brief. Um, as I agree with Councillor Hazelton, it seems everybody's entrenched or going along to get along. I, I suggest too bad for the fish. This is a mistake. I'm not supporting it. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, then I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor, that's in favor of lifting the holes. I have one, two, three, four, and I make five. So that is carried five to two. Thank you. And with that, I have Mr. Mayor, if I may, is Councillor Bochak? Yes, please. I'm being moved um, upstairs at the hospital here, so I have to log out. I just want to thank my fellow councillors for a great term and um, look forward to seeing uh, everyone next term. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, I have to check out. I'm headed upstairs. Well, take, take care, Councillor Bochak. Thank you. Best wishes from all of us. Thank you. I have a, a motion in front of me moved by Councillor Cooper, second by Councillor Douglas. Be it resolved the Planning Council adopt bylaw 2022 096 to confirm the proceedings of the October 12th, 2022 Council meeting. All those in favor. And that is carried. Moved by Councillor Douglas, seconded by Councillor Hazelton. Be it resolved the Planning Council does now adjourn at 1137 a.m. until November 3rd, 2022 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair. All those in favor. And that is carried. We are now adjourned.